there. This is Daisy and this is Mr. Danger Noodle. Did you know in a classic 1969 study, fear of snakes was not just the most common fear among participants. More people met the clinical criteria for animal phobias than a phobia of death. Whether it be snakes, clowns or public speaking, our fears and phobias are as varied as the people who fear them. Well, what's the difference between your average garden variety fear of snakes and a clinically significant phobia? And what drives these fears? This week we'll take a look at the symptoms of phobias, the mechanisms that drive their development and maintenance, and the treatments that allow people to face their fears and recover from phobias. Anxiety disorders form one of the largest categories in DSM-5. Some of the anxiety disorders you might be familiar with are specific phobia, social phobia, panic disorder and agoraphobia, and generalised anxiety disorders. Some of the less well-known anxiety disorders include separation anxiety disorder and selective mutism. We'll be focusing on specific phobia and social phobia in this course. Way back in 2012 before DSM-5 was published, Post-traumatic stress disorder and obsessive compulsive disorders were also classified as anxiety disorders. But in the DSM-5 this has changed. PTSD now comes under trauma and stressor related disorders and OCD comes under obsessive compulsive and related disorders. POP QUIZ! What do all anxiety disorders have in common? Uh, anxiety? Very good. And what do people do when they're afraid of something? Uh, they avoid it? Exactly. The thing that is common across all anxiety disorders is not just that someone is really scared of an object or situation, they also engage in avoidance behaviours, also known as safety behaviours. This is important, so we're going to come back to this idea a little bit later when we discuss the scientific models of phobias. The other thing that all anxiety disorders have in common is that they all cause a clinically significant impairment in daily functioning. Now the thought of holding a snake might send shivers down your spine, but if it doesn't interfere with your everyday functioning, then it's not a phobia. You might be really scared of snakes, but for the 12.5% of the population living with a clinically diagnosed phobia, both the fear and the avoidance behaviours interfere with their life and stop them from doing their everyday activities. Someone with snake phobia might avoid going to the mailbox from fear that a snake is just waiting to jump out and get them. They might send their roommate into the living room to scout around for snakes before they enter. They might avoid going to sleep because they have persistent nightmares about snakes. They might avoid buying postage stamps because Australia Post just love putting our native animals on them. The other thing that all anxiety disorders have in common, and why PTSD is no longer classified as an anxiety disorder, with anxiety disorders the fear is disproportionate to the actual level of threat. I went to school with a girl who has a genuine clinically diagnosed phobia of buttons. The buttons on jeans were kind of okay because you couldn't see any holes in them, but if there were holes, it was bad. Really bad. And the more holes there were, the more terrifying the button would be. As a child, the family doctor didn't believe that her fear was real. So he got her to take buttons out of her jar and line them up on a table one by one. By the time she got to the third button, she was so terrified that she vomited and passed out. Now over the last few weeks, you may have noticed that we often use animals like rats to study mental illness. And this is so effective treatments can be developed to help the millions of people who are affected by these disorders. But why use rats as models? It's not like hordes of rats are having some sort of anxiety crisis about about the presentation that they need to stand up and give in front of the class next week. When psychologists use animal models, it's because they're interested in the biological factors that contribute to the disorder. Because rats are not really affected by cognitive or socio-cultural factors that can contribute to human disorders, rat studies can remove these effects, isolating the biological factors so that they can be fully understood. And because we share about 90% of our DNA with rats, they make pretty good biological analogues. For reference, we also share about 96% of our DNA with our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, and over 60% of our DNA with a banana. So did this count? So does this count a cannibalism? One of the 
reasons that rats make such good analogues for studying the physiological symptoms of fear and anxiety is because the symptoms of fear and anxiety are pretty much the same in all mammals. And that's because physiological symptoms of fear and anxiety are activated by the autonomic nervous system. This table developed by Michael Davis in 1997 highlights just how similar the physiological symptoms are between scared rats and generalised anxiety disorder. So how do anxiety disorders develop? What makes someone's everyday normal fear turn into something that is so distressing and so disabling? One of the theories that attempts to explain what people are afraid of and why is preparedness theory developed by Seligman in 1971. Seligman recognised that the overwhelming majority of phobias develop towards objects and situations that our ancestors would have needed to avoid in order to keep themselves safe and pass on their genes. Things like heights, snakes, spiders, electrical storms or dogs, or maybe wolves in their case. All of these things can genuinely kill you, so it would probably be advantageous if natural selection did us all a favour and preserve the genes that made us wary of these things. Cheers, evolution! But preparedness theory is not without its criticisms. First, we know that phobias develop to innocuous things like buttons. Granted, this is very rare, but it does happen. Also, if this is a genetically driven trait, then we would expect that someone with a phobia of snakes would also have a fear of other dangerous reptiles or other dangerous situations. But this doesn't happen. Usually phobias are pretty specific. But despite these issues, it still seems like evolution has played a pretty big role in determining what we're afraid of. It's just probably not the only thing that's going on. As we've seen over the last few weeks, learning through experience plays a huge part in helping us navigate our ever-changing environment. If you have a bad experience with a snake or a dog, you're probably going to learn that these are scary things and that you should probably avoid them. Maurer's dual process model of avoidance has formalised this idea in associative learning terms. The first part of the dual process model is the classical conditioning acquisition paradigm that you're already familiar with. So a person sees a dog, the sensory experience of the dog is the conditioned stimulus, so the shape of the dog, its colour, its size, how it moves, all of these things form part of the CS. Unconditioned stimulus, the US, is the bad thing that happens. So the US could be getting bitten or the dog might suddenly bark or it might move in a threatening way. This sudden and unexpected noise or movement provokes a startle response in your body. Now you don't need to learn to jump when you hear a loud noise, so the startle response is the unconditioned response or the UR. What you learn during that encounter is an association between the physical experience of dogs and the fact that they can move in unpredictable ways or make scary noises or that they can bite. The CS has become associated with the US. So classical conditioning forms the first part of the dual process model. The second part of the dual process model explains what makes the phobia continue. What maintains that fear? The answer is instrumental conditioning. Specifically, it is negative reinforcement. So remember that negative reinforcement is when a behaviour is performed to make something bad go away or to stop that thing from happening in the first place. It's classified as reinforcement because the performance of the behaviour, the performance of the avoidance behaviour or the safety behaviour, the frequency of performing this behaviour increases. And that's what makes it reinforcement. The performance of the behaviour increases. It's also classified as negative reinforcement because something bad, fear or anxiety is being taken away from the situation when the person performs the avoidance behaviour. And every time a person avoids the scary situation and the behaviour is negatively reinforced, this strengthens the association between the safety behaviour and the outcome. If I do this behaviour, scary things don't happen. So you can see how classical conditioning can make people develop phobias and you can see how instrumental conditioning, specifically through negative reinforcement, can make the fear continue. But what about all those people with a snake phobia who have never had a negative experience with a snake before? Just like 
preparedness theory, the dual process model doesn't explain everything, but it does explain a lot, especially how avoiding scary situations only perpetuates our fears. And when they're viewed together, it explains why in a lab situation, non-phobic people will learn to fear evolutionarily relevant stimuli, like pictures of snakes, much faster than they will learn to fear neutral stimuli, like pictures of buttons. To finish off, I'll briefly go over some of the cognitive factors that can also play a role in the development and maintenance of phobias and other anxiety disorders. In the lectures last week on depression, Josh spoke about Beck's cognitive model and the tendency for depressed individuals to attend to sad faces and negative stimuli more than they attend to positive ones. Well, interestingly, we see a similar thing in phobias. Although in everyday life, phobic people do whatever they can to avoid the thing that scares them, in the lab, the object that they're afraid of will capture their attention more readily, and they'll respond faster to words that are associated with that object. So if me and a snake phobic person would have a race to see who could press a button the fastest when we saw the word fang or slither, I would probably lose. People with phobias also experience perceptual distortion. So when people who are afraid of snakes actually encounter a snake, they often interpret the snake's behaviour as being threatening or chasing them or getting ready to bite them, even if they're just chilling like Daisy here. And just like attentional bias, perceptual distortion is also replicated in the lab. So in 1992, Rackman and Cook showed a harmless garter snake in a tank to people with and without snake phobias. Although both groups of people perceived the snake as being about the same size and the same length, phobic people reported that the snake's tongue was sharper and that it flicked around a lot more and that the tongue's movement was directed at them, whereas non-phobics just said that the snake was moving. When Josh spoke about cognitive theory, he also mentioned appraisals, or the way that we interpret events. Just like depression, we also see negative or faulty appraisals in fear and anxiety. So when fearing pictures of snakes, it's not the actual danger involved that makes the object or situation scary, it's the way people interpret the situation that predicts whether they'll be afraid of it or not. So you might think, oh, it's a snake, snakes are scary, if I go outside there's gonna be snakes there and they're gonna wanna bite me, if I see a snake I'm going to completely freak out and I won't be able to cope and that's the clincher. These types of negative appraisals, especially thoughts of being helpless and powerless, play a really big role in the development and maintenance of phobias. Thanks for watching. In this video we covered types of anxiety disorders and the DSM criteria of phobias, animal models and the physiological symptoms of anxiety disorders, as well as some theories and models explaining the development and maintenance of phobias. These included preparedness theory, Malra's dual process model, and Beck's cognitive model. In the next video, Josh will take you through how phobias are treated and how these models and theories account for why these treatments work.